Let every go signal remind you that you do go farther with signal gasoline. The Signal Oil Program. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, beware the bridegroom. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Presently, I'll tell you of nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. But first, I think you'll be interested in a letter from Chapter Joseph E. Boland, who writes, This is to express to Signal Oil Company... My gratitude and that of literally thousands of men for the abundant supply of salvo games. Both on the outbound voyage and on the return trip, when we brought back many wounded and battle-weary men, you could find salvo games in progress on any part of the ship. And I noticed that whereas card and chess and other games were often interrupted when I walked by, salvo players were so engrossed they couldn't see anything but their games. I sincerely hope Signal Oil Company will be able to continue their generous supply of this excellent game. Friends, several weeks ago, we announced on this program that a limited supply of salvo games would be available to the public. There are still a few of these games left at Signal stations. However, in view of the constantly increasing demand for salvo games from men in the armed forces, the Signal Oil Company feels that from now on, Every salvo game should be sent where it's most needed, for the recreation of our boys in uniform. And now, the whistler. The lights are low, the music is soft. It's the cameo bar, one of those dimly lit bistros in New York where people come to drink and be happy where others come to drink and be sad. Over there in the corner at the bar, John Lane and Biff Allen are sitting. They're morose. New York hasn't been so kind. New York hasn't even noticed. They're on their uppers, and they don't at all like the prospect. Well, Biff, drink up. I'm in no hurry. This is probably my last drink in a long time. I can't afford any more. Hmm. Where do we go from here? Johnny, I was just going to ask you the same thing. Oh, what's the new racket going to be? I'm fresh out. Life is sad. It's lousy. We had to come to New York. (laughs) Yeah. Bigger pickings, you said. Bigger suckers. All right, all right, I was wrong. You were 100% wrong. Yes, yes. Money is the root of all evil. Oh, that's wrong, Biff. The love of money. All right. Sports your college education. (laughs) You know, when I feel good, when I'm in the box, life's no good when you're broke. Whoever said money isn't everything didn't know what they were talking about. It's everything all right with me. I'm going back home. You off your nut. Starving's no fun. Another drink, boys? Oh, sure, the same. You bet. Cold now, ain't it? Yeah, I'm getting colder every minute. The hometown's cooled off by now. It's after elections. Uh Uh-uh. I'm afraid we're remembered. Well, here you are, boys. Why don't you look what you're doing? Well, gee, sorry, fellas. Oh, you're sorry? That's going to help my suit, ain't it? All the clumsy ignorance. He said he was sorry, Johnny. Yeah, I said I was sorry. Oh, don't, don't, don't bother. Well, I'll fill your glasses up again. Oh, gee. Oh, thanks. I said I was sorry. Johnny, you want to watch that temper. It was an accident. Yes, I know, I know. Anyhow, we have to think of something. There's nothing new under the sun. Shakespeare said that? Could be. You know, Johnny, I've been sitting here looking into this glass of scotch. What do you see? The reflection of my right eye. Yeah. It's bloodshot. Oh, I'm trying to think. 
Look at the reflection of your right eye. It's more soothing. I could spit in my right eye. I'm that sore. No future in it. No, I'm going back home. I miss my old lady. She could fix a beef stroganoff that would melt in your mouth. You've got exotic tastes. What's wrong with you? I miss my old lady. Oh, she'd throw you out of the house. You know, Johnny, maybe we could try to dream up something sort of legal. Uh-uh. I tried that once. Yeah. Hey, look. Hmm? What? That mouse in a red dress. Where? There. Sitting alone in the booth. Ah, uh, too skinny. She's passing out. So? Let's give her a hand. Oh, listen, Sir Galahad. We're desperate, ain't we? An all-time law. Well? I don't get it. I... Hey, wait a minute. Uh, maybe I do. Yeah, you're the smooth one of this combo. Go ahead. Worth the chance? Maybe Faith sent her. She's got class. I'm not interested in her social background. It's her money I'm thinking about. Them's real diamonds on her fingers, or I'm a cross-eyed kangaroo. Stay here. Now make it good, Johnny. Remember the mortgage on the old homestead. Uh, this isn't chivalry gleaming in my eye, but it may pass for it. You leave it to me. Who knows? She might pave the way to a whole acre of beef stroganoff. <laughs> And so John Allen goes over to the booth and speaks to the little mouse in the red dress. Presently, they leave the cameo bar, the girl leaning heavily on John's arm and hail a taxi. And as it drives off, John gets a chance to eye those diamonds at close range. They're real all right, and you've fallen to something good here, John. Where? Where am I? What happened? You're in a taxi, Miss Warren. I'm seeing you home. You were a pretty sick girl back in that bar. How do you know my name? Who are you? I looked in your purse, hoping I might find a clue to your address. I not only found a clue, I found the whole works. Right on this card, Miss Julie Warren, Park Plaza Hotel, New York City. You are Miss Warren, aren't you? It was very kind of you. I wasn't sick. I mean, not the way you think. I had only one drink. <laughs> Sometimes it takes only one. No, no, I, I haven't been feeling very well. I had no business being there. Probably nobody in the joint has any business being there. We're almost to the hotel, aren't we? Yes. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, my name is Lane, John Lane. How do you do? And another, by the way, I um, helped myself to a small portion of the contents of your purse to defray the expenses of this transportation. I hope you don't mind. Not at all. With careless stupidity, I, I left my wallet at it's home. It's all right. You know, you shouldn't carry so much money around with you. Dangerous? Oh, haven't you heard? There are thieves abroad in the night. Are you a thief? Oh, do I look like a highwayman? Highwaymen rarely do. Oh, my head. Look, you, you'd better lie back. Relax. You'd better take your hand off my arm. Well, I just wanted you to be comfortable. I'm sorry. You have done me a real favor, haven't you? I thought so. But I have to be careful. A millionaire, huh? Several times over. Hmm, must be convenient. The opposite. Why? My grandfather, Josiah T. Warren, made several dozen fortunes by dreaming up a new kind of soap. When he died, he left $20 million to me. So, naturally, you have to be careful. Everyone is after my money. Oh, why attribute base motives to everyone? <laughs> Look at me. My money hasn't made me glamorous or beautiful. I'm a plain Jane, and I know it. So, when anyone acts interested, I naturally attribute it to the money. Oh, you've got a complex. You are in back the head. Thanks for being gallant. <laughs> Ah, here, here's the Park Plaza. Yes, yes. Thank you. May I see you again? Why? Suspicious. As always. I'd like to snap you out of that complex, poor little rich girl. You think you're up to the job? I'm a bundle of neuroses. My middle name is Freud. Mine is Cautious. You know, there might be a common meeting ground for the two somewhere along the line. Well. Friday night. All right. Sure. As they say in the confession magazines, it's a date. Yes, it's a date, John Lane It was easy, wasn't it? She may be cautious, but not cautious enough And so you take back the good news to your friend, Biff Hello, Biff Johnny, well? We're set Honest? What a break Good hunch, huh? All lead pipes sing Tell me She's bored. Yeah? She's got millions, and she's bored. Holy cow. Oh, what we stepped into. Yeah, but can you step out when you want to? Who said I wanted to step out? 
What do you mean, Johnny? Now, don't say I didn't warn you, Biff, but you are now looking at the lucky gent who will shortly marry and settle down with Julie Warren, the soap heiress. Enjoying yourself, Julie? Mm, uh Uh-huh. My favorite orchestra. Oh, you dance beautifully, Johnny. You're my favorite partner. Ah, I'll bet you say that to all your partners. (laughs) Happy? Very happy. Let's never stop dancing, shall we? Whatever you say. You're good. You know, I was raised in a farm in Michigan. I've been riding since I was nine, but you gave me a real race. Well, I should, Johnny. I went to the best riding academy. Ah, you tired? Not a bit. Oh, you look swell, Julie. Radiant. I owe it to you, Johnny. You got me out of that shell and into the open. These weeks have been wonderful. Come on, come on. I'll race you back to the stable. Okay, here I come right after you. So the campaign continues. Dining, dancing, horseback riding, the theater, the races, the works. And it's a success. Julie Warren and John Lane sneak off quietly to Connecticut one day and are married. Off to Bermuda for a honeymoon, a blissful idol, and then return. Make it look good, Johnny. Darling, now we're back. I I can't just sit around being a rich woman's husband. Why not, dear? Well, I just couldn't. You get bored? Might. Yes, you might. Then you won't mind, dear? Of course not, Johnny. Oh, good. I want you to be happy, and if you have to be busy to be happy, of course. Oh, I'm glad you agree with me, sweet. <laughs> Kiss me? Yes, sir. A pleasure. And so John Lane gets a job, or so he tells Julie. So he's not around in the daytime. But by night, there's the theater and parties... Weekend yachting excursions, plane trips, nothing too expensive or too grand. Life is easy. Life is charming without care. The marriage of John Lane and Julie Warren is a sensational success until one day... Hello, John. Hiya, darling. Back from work so early. Yes, I'll have to hurry and dress. By the way, we're not going to the theater tonight. Oh, why not? We have some talking to you. Oh, what do you mean? Johnny, you love me, don't you? Of course, dear. That's good. Well, what are you leading up to, Julie? Sit down, won't you? Yeah, sure. I have something to tell you. Ah, so I gathered. Comfortable? Quite. Uh, Don't stall. I'm broke. What about the soap? A lie. And the soap millions? Sheer fabrication. No. Yes. Surprise. (sighs) Julie. I can see you're surprised. But the setup, your clothes, your jewels. Tentative, ephemeral, and apt. <laughs> you fooled me. You don't really mind, do you, Johnny? I love you, Why darling. Why did you do I... it? Why? And how did you do it? I grew up in Red Wing, Minnesota. Go on. Have you ever been to Red Wing, Minnesota? No. I wanted to get away. I was an orphan. When I was 12, an old woman adopted. She wanted a maid, cheap. You? Yes. The millions, the clothes, your rings, I... I'm coming to that. This old woman tried to be nice, but she didn't quite know how to be. She let me go to night school and brush up on my grammar and things like that. Last year, she died. She left me $10,000. I've never been very popular, Johnny. I had a very exciting life, and I wanted romance and excitement and glamour. The husband... So I sunk the whole $10,000 in clothes and jewels. This apartment. And you married me. Everything came true. Johnny, I love you. I love you terribly. I I know this is probably something of a shock that I should practice such a deception, but, well, I I didn't want to go on fooling you anymore. (laughs) Anyhow, I can't afford to. The rent's overdue now. What are we going to do? Do? Yes, Johnny. What? 
I haven't a cent. But your job... I haven't any. But you said I've been that going you... to the races on the money you gave me. <laughs> then we're both fakes. Ten carats. <laughs> ah, it's a laugh, isn't it? We're listening to The Whistler, brought to you by your friend, the Signal Oil Company, marketers of famous Signal Gasoline, your best buy today. Remember to let every go signal remind you, you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Quite a surprise, isn't it, John? You married Julie because you thought she was worth millions. Now you find out she hasn't a cent. Two cheats caught with each other. So you go out for a walk to talk things over and to have a talk with Biff Allen at his rooming house. You're kidding, Johnny. No, I'm not kidding. She hasn't got a cent. The rent's overdue. Who'd believe it? We got taken by a mouse in a red dress. Uh, I'm not so sure. What do you mean? Maybe we'll come out of it okay after all. How? If the dame hasn't got any money... I've just remembered something. An insurance policy. Huh? An insurance policy? Yeah, for 20 grand. I don't get it. No, but I do if she dies. Yeah? Yeah, I ran across it one day on her things. She said she'd forgotten about it, but now that we were married, she'd have me named as beneficiary. And she did? Yeah, she did. I saw to it. Mm -hmm. But I still don't see. You don't get it until she dies. That's right. And she's good for plenty of years yet. Yeah. And we need the money now. Right again. So, there's only one solution. Yeah, what? She's got to die now. Oh, but she... Wait a minute, Johnny. No. We've done a lot of things, but we never got in anything like that. I don't plan to. I'm not interested in murder. In this state, you're burned. Not me. I'll figure a way. I won't get caught. Johnny, listen. Plenty of guys have tried, and they got caught. Don't do it. We can make money some other way and live to enjoy you it. You worry too much, Biff. Now, don't worry. I'll be okay. Johnny, you mean you're really going to do it? Yes, I am. I'm not going to be made a sucker by a mouse in a red dress. Well, Johnny, you're going to take the chance, are you? The big chance? Think you can get away with it, do you? Well, plan it carefully. Figure the whole thing out as you walk back to the hotel. Get up your nerve as you slip in the back door and sneak up the stairs. Now, into the apartment and get it over with as fast as possible. Johnny? Johnny, is that you? Oh, I was so worried about you. Where'd you go? I... Johnny? What's the matter? Why are you looking at me like that? Johnny... Stop it. Johnny? What what are you going to do? Johnny? Stop. John, stop it! All right, it's done. Now your plan. The plan you thought of coming back here. That's it. Drag out the bureau drawers. Throw their contents on the floor. Knock over chairs. Make it look good. Make it look like a terrific struggle. Like a burglar had tried to rifle the place. Yes, that's it. It's a shambles. Now, get out of here quickly. Down the back stairs, the way you came in. Don't let anybody see you. And hurry to the cameo bar. Biff's not there, as you thought he'd be. But the bartender is, and he's the one you want anyway. <laughs> Hello there, Mr. Lane. What's it going to be? Same as the last one. Last one? But you didn't have any other drink. Oh, sure I did. Don't you remember? About 15 minutes ago? Hey, you're joking, Mr. Lane. You just came in. You haven't been here all day. Mr. Allen was here, but he got a phone call and left about 15 minutes ago. Oh, now, Joe, you could be mistaken about that, couldn't you? Maybe you just didn't see me come in. Maybe you just didn't notice me sitting back there in the back booth. Yeah, but I would have... Now, uh... look, maybe this will help you to remember that I've been here for two hours. All afternoon, almost. Hey... That's a hundred dollar bill. Yeah. But, uh... You could use a hundred, couldn't you? I, uh... 
Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, it's yours. Go on, take it. That's right. Now, Joe, I'll have another one, just like the last one. Uh, yeah, 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 sure, Mr. Lane. Got your water. Coming up. Simple, isn't it, Johnny? Your alibi is all established. Joe's like anybody else. He'll keep his mouth shut for a hundred bucks. Now all you have to do is go back to the hotel, taking your time. Stop at the desk for your key. Ride up in the elevator and chat with the operator. Go into the apartment, find the body, and yell for help. Simple, isn't it? But it's even simpler when you get there, because the elevator boy has news for you. There's something doing up on your floor, Mr. Lane. Something doing? What? I don't know, but there are cops up there. This is even better. Somebody's already found the body. A chambermaid, perhaps. You get off, go in, and there they are. Why, what's the matter? What's going on here? Oh, you're Mr. Lane? Yes, I'm Mr. Lane, but what are all these... I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Lane, I... I have some bad news for you. Well, what's the matter? Well, what's happened here? Where's Julie? I'm sorry, Mr. Lane. There's been a tragedy. Your wife is dead. Dead? Dead? No, it can't be. It can't be. Now, please. Please, Mr. Lane. I'll take it. Hey! Hey, somebody! Hurry up! Bring me some water! That's right, Johnny. Put on a good act. Lay it on thick. Take a few minutes before you're coherent enough to ask the inspector a question. How did it happen? One of the maids saw a suspicious character breaking into your room. She called the police, but we didn't get here in time to save Mrs. Lane. The place was in shambles, and she'd been strangled. You said a suspicious character? Yes, a burglar. We got here in time to catch him just as he was trying to leave. You caught him? Yes, yes. Don't worry, Mr. Lane. He'll be brought to justice for the murder of your wife. Now, what can this mean, John? This is really an unexpected twist. But it makes everything even simpler. There's nothing to it now. But they want you to go down and take a look at the man they caught, and so you do. You'd want to anyway. You're curious to see the man you're sending to the electric chair... Only you're not quite prepared for the shock. Here he is, Mr. Lane. Biff Allen, he's called. He swears he didn't kill your wife. But he won't say much else except that he wanted to see you. I don't know why. Yeah, I wanted to see him because I figure he'll have something to say. I figure he'll tell you I couldn't have killed his wife. Go on, Johnny, tell him. You know this man, Mr. Lane? Why, uh, go on, Johnny, tell him I didn't kill her. I never saw him before in my life. Johnny! You wouldn't do that to me. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know you. Okay, if that's the way you're going to work it. Inspector, he knows me all right. Only this afternoon he come to my rooming house. My landlady will testify to that. And he told me he was going to murder his wife. That's fantastic. He's making up a fantastic story to try to worm out of it. You know he did it. You caught him there. I went there to try to stop you from doing it, but I was too late. Mr. Lane, where were you about three this afternoon? Oh, you don't believe this man, surely. I'm not sure, Mr. Lane. You see, that's one thing that puzzled us. The coroner says your wife died about three o'clock. We didn't catch this man until almost four. Why should he have stayed so long? But, but I was at a bar all afternoon. The bartender will testify to that. I'm sure he will. Okay, we'll see. Come along. <laughs> Things aren't going so well, are they, Johnny? Now everything depends on Joe, the bartender. But you can depend on him, can't you, Johnny? You, uh... You the bartender here? You been on duty here all afternoon? Yeah, sure. From two o'clock on. Okay. Did you ever see this man? Uh, Oh, yeah, sure. That's Mr. Lane. Was he here about three o'clock this afternoon? No. No, he wasn't. He gave me a hundred bucks to say so, but he wasn't. He didn't get here till after 3.30. Why, you... Here, 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 here. Take it easy. I'm sorry, Mr. Lane. I thought it was just your wife you wanted to fool. I had no idea it was anything to do with the police. I can't take any chances like that, Mr. Lane. 
I would have told you that. All right, Lane. Now you'd better come along with me. Quietly. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, here's a typical American success story. The story of Hal Halverson, who opened a small signal station in East Long Beach, California, ten years ago. For Hal, this wasn't just another job. As with all signal dealers, scientific lubrication of motor cars was his permanent business. And he kept doing that job so conscientiously that today, Hal Halverson's signal station has doubled in size and it takes three assistants to serve the customers who come back year after year. One of the things they particularly like is that they can call Hal at home anytime they need help. For instance, recently a Long Beach customer called that his car was stalled, and he thought it was out of gas. When Hal took out some gas, he found the trouble was really a clogged gas line, and the customer was soon on his way again. Well, that, friends, is typical of the kind of service we have in mind when we say, you're doing your car a real favor when you get acquainted with your neighborhood signal dealer. He's not only a trained expert in lubrication, but because that's his permanent business, your signal dealer is conscientiously interested, as interested as you are, in helping your car go farther. And now, back to the whistler. Yes, Johnny Lane now sits brooding in a solitary cell up the river. You can't blame him for being unhappy about Biff wandering in and spoiling the setup. Only what he's really unhappy about is that Biff didn't get there a little sooner in time to stop the murder. Yes, you see, the reason Biff came to the hotel and broke into the room was to stop Johnny, to tell him that there was no need to murder Julie that he had checked up and found out that she was a long way from being penniless. In fact, $20 million away from it. She invented the penniless story to test Johnny's love for her. She really loved him, and she didn't know what a chance she was taking. And he didn't know he was throwing away the sweetest chance of his life. Yes, he's sad, all right, but not for long. The state's going to end his troubles for him any day now. Monday at 9 o'clock, the Signal Oil Program will bring you another strange tale by the Whistler. The Signal Oil Program is broadcast for your entertainment by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal's famous Go Farther gasoline and motor oil, and by your neighborhood Signal Oil dealer, who is at your service daily to keep your car running for the duration. The Signal Oil Program, directed by George W. Allen, with story by Victor Kushner and music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Bob Anderson speaking for your friend, the Signal Oil Company, and suggesting once again that you let every go signal remind you that you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.